Hello again. In this module, we're going to cover local spatial autocorrelation. And today we start with the uh, concept of ELISA, a local indicator of spatial autocorrelation, and the most common form, which is the local Moran. This is a local version of the global Moran statistic, which we covered in the previous module. So I have actually three different sets of slides for this module. First, we go over the principles. I outline what I understand by this LISA concept. And then I go into the specifics of the local Moran. And then in particular, the most important part is how you visualize it in the form of significance and cluster maps. And then the second set of slides will cover a couple of other local statistics, uh, notably the Geddes Ort statistic and the local Geary. And then I have a third little set of slides that digs into the interpretation and the notion of significance, which is very complex in these kinds of statistics. So let's start with the concept of ELISA. And before we go there, uh, recall the distinction I made in the last module between clustering and clusters. Uh, global tests for spatial autocorrelation reject the null of spatial randomness in favor of either positive or negative uh, spatial autocorrelation, but they do not tell you anything about where these clusters might be. And that's really the domain of cluster detection. Cluster detection is about finding locations that are more similar or more dissimilar than they would be randomly in specific locations, not just for the pattern as a whole. And so we have to find where these locations are, and we also have to assess significance. As I mentioned earlier, this is not uh, that simple for LISA statistics. Um, you should be aware that there's many, many cluster detection methods, and I can only cover a small fraction of these in this quarter. In the spring quarter, um, the course is uh, devoted to spatial cluster analysis, so there we dig, dig into this in much more detail. So what is then this idea of a local indicator of spatial association, or ELISA? There are two uh, components to it. One is actually more practical than the other. Uh, the first component is we have a statistic for each location, and we can assess the significance of that statistic for each location. The second aspect is a little bit more technical and it, it just um, tightens the relationship between the local statistic and the global statistic. And specifically, it states that the sum of the LISA, so a LISA is one for each location, the sum of all these LISAs is proportional to a global statistic. And we'll see shortly how the local Moran statistic is connected to the global Moran statistic by a proportional relationship. So those are the two characteristics of what I defined as ELISA. Um, and so then what we do in local spatial autocorrelation analysis is um, assess significance. And we'll um, not talk about that too much right now, but revisit that in, in the third set of slides. And then, most importantly, we will identify and find the location of spatial clusters and spatial outliers. Spatial clusters, um, hot spots or cold spots, or spatial outliers are locations that are very dissimilar from their neighbors. And remember our discussion of the Moran scatter plot, where we started by dividing the scatter plot into four quadrants. Two of these were associated with positive spatial autocorrelation, and we call them high, high and low, low. And two more were associated with negative spatial autocorrelation, and we call them high, low and low, high. These same terms will come back here, where we will actually identify which of these locations are significant in the sense that we will define later. So. In the Mor Moran scatter plot, you have all of them. Here, we will cut that down to only those locations that are actually significant. And then on a technical level, um, there is a distinction between the significance uh, 
in the absence of global spatial autocorrelation or in the presence of global spatial autocorrelation. In a nutshell, the interpretation of significance in these contexts is fairly complex. And that's why personally, I don't like to use this concept and I use interesting locations instead because it's almost impossible to get your p-values correct in this context. So we'll revisit that later. Okay, uh, formally, every decomposable global statistic, what does that mean? Um, the global statistic consists of a sum over the individual observations i of some expression. If that sum is scaled by something, the scaling is irrelevant. This part is the most important part. So if the global statistic can be decomposed into the sum of the contributions of each location separately, so no interaction between the locations, just separate sum, then that part associated with each location, which I call here the component associated with location i, that is the local statistic. So it's actually very simple. Anytime, and we've already seen a couple of these, uh, remember both Moran's i and Geary c had a double sum, a sum over i and then a sum over j. So as any time we can express something as a sum over i of something that stands on its own, then that something that stands on its own is the local statistic. Okay, a little more formally, we saw in the previous module, and actually a couple of times already, uh, that a measure of spatial autocorrelation is about combining attribute similarity with geographical or locational similarity. Attribute similarity is some function that relates, remember, again, autocorrelation, it's the same variable, at two different locations, at a pair of locations. And we've seen earlier how we can have cross-product statistic. Moran Zai is an example. Square difference, Geary C is an example, and also absolute difference, we haven't covered that. And then the second part, very important, is how do we formally express spatial similarity? And we saw that we do that by means of these spatial weights, elements W, I, J. And remember, um, in the uh, two, two modules back, when I talked about the general concept of what is a spatial autocorrelation statistic, we had this expression, sum over I, sum over J, F, function of attribute similarity between Xi and Xj, and then Wij. Double sum. The local statistic is the sum only over J of the spatial weights and the attribute similarity. So for each, essentially, essentially for each observation or for each location, we construct something that relates to the similarity with the neighbors. And that then becomes the local statistic. Local Moran, we know the global Moran is this ratio. In the numerator, we have attribute similarity as a cross product, geographical similarity as a weights element. And in the denominator, we have the variance. Remember, when the, uh, the weights are row standardized, that the sum S0 of all the elements of the weights matrix equals the number of observations, or n. So these terms in the numerator, denominator, they cancel out. So we end up with this simple expression. This was also the expression that we used when we showed that the slope of the linear fit through the Moran scatter plot is Moran's i. It's the same expression. Now, when you look at this expression, the denominator is fixed. That doesn't change with an observation. And we can write the numerator as the sum over i of this second part. So as we, as we just discussed, this second part then becomes the local statistic. And what is this second part? 
Well, apart from the scaling factor, which doesn't uh, matter, it doesn't change, we have zi, the value of i, we have the sum over the neighbors of the values at the neighboring location. So basically, this is the average of the neighbors and some scaling factor, which is irrelevant. So if you recall, in a Moran scatter plot, we plotted z at i against its spatial lag, which is the average of the neighboring values. Now we're going to take the product of these two, and that is in fact local Moran statistic. Remember the second aspect, so the first aspect was get a statistic for each location. We have that. Now we make the connection between the global statistic and the local statistic. And just simple algebra shows that the sum of the local statistics is n times the global statistic. In other words, the global statistic is the average of the local Moran statistics. And this gives us a connection between the global and the local. And then going back to our discussion of the Moran scatter plot, we were interested in finding high leverage points that may affect the slope of the um, linear fit. In a similar vein, we can look at um, how these local Morans relate or are div distributed around the average of the uh, the average, which corresponds to the global Moran xi. And as, as in any kind of analysis of outliers or leverage, there may be points that have an inordinate effect on this average value. And we want to understand that in order to assess possible uh, structural breaks or spatial heterogeneity, which I've discussed in the context of the Moran scatter plot. So it's the same thing here. Um, this is not used too much. The main use of the local Moran statistic is to find local clusters and local spatial outliers. And inference, uh, I will devote a whole section on this, but just quickly, just like with the global Moran, we can go analytically or computationally. Analytically is fraught with difficulties. Even though the expressions are very simple and very tempting to use, uh, they can be quite misleading because they are um, based on an approximation. And the approximation requires larger and larger numbers of neighbors in this particular case. But that's not the case. In uh, local spatial autocorrelation analysis, the number of neighbors is typically very limited. So just to make a long story short, that is a reason why these approximations are typically very poor. So my advice is don't use it, even though it's very tempting, it's very easy to calculate, it's very easy to implement in software. My preference and what we have done in Geoda is to implement a computational approach. And this computational approach, approach uses the same logic we've already seen a couple of times, namely the logic of permutation. And by permutation, we mean that we mimic the null hypothesis of spatial randomness by reshuffling observations around on the map. There's one distinction here. Because it is a local statistic, we have to hold the value at a given observation fixed. And that's why we call this conditional permutation, because it's conditional upon observing the given value, we call it zi or xi, at location i. So as a result, we can't reshuffle all the observations, but we reshuffle all but one, all but the value that we observe at a given location. But other than that, it's exactly the same principle. The complication, though, in local analysis is that we have to repeat this process for each observation. So in the global, in the analysis of the global Moran, we do the 999 permutations and we're done. Here we have to repeat that process for every single observation. And then for every single observation, we get a reference distribution and we can assess how extreme 
the particular local Moran Zai statistic is with respect to that reference distribution. So it's the exact same logic as before, except it's applied to each observation in turn. That's why we call it conditional permutation. And we've used this graph before, this red distribution is the re reference distribution, and so then we have to assess how extreme um, our observed statistic is. And I want to um, come back to this a little more formally because I haven't really elaborated on this. What we use in this analysis is called a pseudo p-value. It looks like a p-value, but it's quite different from an analytical p-value. It's simply a ratio. It's a ratio that's computed by comparing the number of simulated values that are equal or more extreme than the actual observed value um, and we we assess that ratio and if that ratio is small enough we reject a null hypothesis and an easy way to do that is uh, by computing this this pseudo p-value here which is a ratio of two elements so m is in the reference distribution so in here we count a number of times, basically we count this little tail of the distribution, the number of times that we find a value equal to or more extreme than the observed one, and we add one to that for the observed one. And then we divide this by the number of replications and plus one for the observed one. Now, this explains very um, easily why we always use replications such as 99, 999, 9,999, because that plus one is a nice even number and it divides and it gives us a ratio that looks just like an ordinary p-value. However, it's very different from an ordinary p-value because it's based on the sample and it's based on the number of replications that we carry out. And let me illustrate this. So we have to be very careful when we compare these p-values between analyses that use a different number of permutations. Um, in my little example here, we have the first case where we have, in both cases, we have no observation from the reference distribution that is equal to or more extreme than the observed value. So if you recall the graph for the global Moranzai or for the global Geary statistic, we had a reference distribution and then for Moranzai, the red bar was way outside and same for Geary C on, on the other side of the distribution. So that's the case we're assessing here. And so if we do 99 permutations, none of them is equal to or more extreme than the observed one, plus one. 99 plus 1, we get a p-value of 0 0.01. Fine. If we do 909 permutations, so we get slightly better approximation of the reference distribution, but still no value is equal to or larger than the observed value, so we now have 1 over 1,000, 0 0.001. Now, we would be very tempted to say that the second case is more significant than the first case, but in fact that's not true. They're both equal evidence that the observed value of the local Moran statistic is extreme relative to the reference distribution. So this is one major difference between pseudo p-values, computational p-values, and analytical p-values that are based on a formal probabilistic framework. So this is purely computational. In fact, some people in the EDA community do not like to use this because it is too tempting to interpret it like a classic p-value. It really isn't. It's just a shortcut to describe the information that we have in the reference distribution. So that's how we will be using it as a pseudo p-value, being well aware that it's not the same thing as the real thing. Then the most important part, at least in practice, is the visualization in terms of specific specialized maps. And there's two kinds. The first one I call the local significance map. 
And it is what it says it is. It's a map that shows the location with a significant local statistic. And it shows a, a gradation by level of significance. So um, this is good to decide what is significant and what is not. It's not good in the sense that it doesn't really tell us much in terms of what these clusters are or whether these are even clusters or outliers. It doesn't tell us anything about the nature of the spatial autocorrelation, something that I've stressed so much in the context of the Moran scatter plot. But it is useful to see um, how sensitive these results are to our uh, permutation approach. So if we get you know, uh, many locations that are identified at a value of 0.05, as we'll see later, that is really not that uh, reliable. But if we have 0 0.00001, then we're pretty secure that there is something going on in that location that either makes it more similar to its neighbors or less similar to its neighbors that is not supposed to be expected. So that's why I like to call these locations interesting locations so that we then, in the spirit of exploration, go further and try to figure out what exactly is going on. So to illustrate this, I'm using a, a data set of uh, socioeconomic data and you'll see this data set um, in several illustrations from now on. It's uh, from 1830, it's for France, um, collected by a sociologist Gary. And the example I have here, 85 departments, and we have data on donations, on charitable donations. So this is a distribution. As I've mentioned many times before, our brain is wired to look at this and say, oh, I see a cluster here, I see a cluster there, right? The, the whole point of the LISA approach is to quantify this, is to make sure we're not kidding ourselves by focusing on clusters that in fact are pure chance, are not really uh, for real. So um, we compute the local Moran for each um, location. We do 99,999 permutations because we can in Geoda, and that gives us a gradation going from this extreme significance from 0 0.00001. There's only one such location right here. We have three locations at 0 0.001 right around that. Then we have a, point, a few at 0 0.01 and then the rest is at 0 0.05. And as, as we'll see later, 0 0.05 is useful, but don't get too excited, right? On the other hand, what is going on here is highly unlikely to be caused to be the result of a spatial random uh, phenomenon. So th this is interesting. This is a focus of our attention. Now, the real power, so to speak, of the LISA analysis is what I call a local cluster map. So a local cluster map does two things. In fact, it's a little bit cheating because it takes the information <clears throat> from the local significance map and then it checks that against the four quadrants in the Moran scatter plot. So then by combining the type of spatial association from the Moran scatter plot with the significance in the significance map, we can categorize each significant location in terms of the four categories that we distinguished earlier on in the Moran scatter plot. And this is reflected on a map with four different colors. So we have, as before, the main diagonal quadrants correspond to positive spatial autocorrelation, which we call spatial clusters. And we have high, high and low, low. Recall this is relative to the mean. It's not an absolute notion of high and low. And then the opposite, the negative spatial autocorrelation, we call spatial outliers. And these are uh, observations with a high value surrounded by low neighbors or observation with a low value surrounded by high neighbors. So, and, and we can adjust these cluster maps by level of significance. So we can show them for 
with a cutoff of 0.05, which is very liberal, or we can show it with a 0.01, and then we'll see in a few minutes how that shrinks these maps. But here's the principle. So earlier, we saw the um, Moran scatter plot right here on the left. So the points in this top right quadrant are all locations that are above the mean, in this sense, surrounded by neighbors that are also above the mean. Now we superimpose this selection on the significance map and we see that you know there are 22 points in here you see that on the in the barrier on in the banner on the bottom uh, the status bar and so these 22 points are divided over some significant ones the green ones and some non-significant ones the gray ones. So this is my point that I made in the previous module that this suggests an association between high and high but that by no means means that this association is significant. So now we flip things around and we color these locations red for high high association and we see that out of the 22 nine of them these nine are significant and we see where they are and this is the essence of a local cluster map so very quickly we can distinguish between significant and non-significant on the one hand and also between the four types of spatial association that we saw earlier in the discussion of the Moran scatter plot so this is um, I think a very powerful, and actually in my experience, has been a very powerful technique to very quickly find structure in spatial data. Now, let's look at the other cases. So, so far we have high, high. The other type of positive spatial autocorrelation is low, low. The uh, low, low is dark blue in the map. These dark blue correspond to these specific locations here. There's 17 that are identified as significant out of the full quadrant, and these are also here located in the significance map. So the, the points, uh, the, the departments that we had earlier seen with very high significance are all located in a low, low cluster, or what we would call a cold spot. In other words, these are departments where people do not give much to charity surrounded by other departments that are similarly not given much to charity. In other words, these individual departments form or start to form a larger region of similar low values. That is the interesting interpretation of this type of map, this type of visualization. So we've dealt with positive spatial autocorrelation, high, high, low, low. Now we go to the negative part. And so the negative one, uh, they tend to be much rarer. This is a low, high situation. We have two observations, um, these two, that are uh, significant. Um, you know, if you look uh, on, the, on the significance map here, you know, they, they're significant, but um, they're not part of a cluster, they're not part of positive spatial autocorrelation, they identify locations that are very different from the average of their neighbor. And to illustrate this, let's go back to the original data and let's just pick on this one here, which is surrounded by these four neighbors. And when we look at the map, at the choropleth map, we see that this is a fairly uh, low shading, probably this one here, and it's surrounded by darker, including a very dark shading, one of the top uh, outliers. So since the spatial lag is an average of the neighbors, we have four neighbors here, one of which has a very high value. So therefore, the average of the neighbors will tend to be fairly high. And in contrast, this value is fairly low, which turns out to be rare enough. This juxtaposition turns out to be rare enough that is identified as significant uh, 
as a significant spatial outlier. And then the last category is high-low. We have a high value above the mean surrounded by an average that's below the mean. And it's, there's only one of these in, in this particular example. And again, we can look a little closer on the original map. We have five neighbors surrounding it. We see a fairly dark color surrounded by fairly light colors. So here we have the opposite phenomenon. We have a, a region with relatively high donations relative to the mean surrounded by departments that do not have very high donations. So that's again the notion of a spatial outlier. So we have this local cluster map which very quickly tells us for a given level of uh, p-value what these um, significant regions are and how they classify themselves into category. And here's what I mentioned just a few minutes ago that as you and I like to call this crank up the p-value the map shrinks. And so the map shrinks to focus attention on locations that again in my terminology are really interesting. Now there's one point, one final point to keep in mind. What are these locations? Especially when we talk about clusters. This is a statistic compute, computed for a particular region, but the statistic is really relating that observation to its neighbors. So the notion of a cluster should really include the neighbors as well. And that's a point I'd like to close with. So what exactly is a cluster? Because the cluster map, in some sense, is a little misleading in that it underestimates the extent of the cluster in the sense that it only shows the significant core of the cluster. So it's, it shows the center, the actual cluster, the fact that this center is similar to its neighbors should also include the neighbors. And so that's something, something to keep in mind when you look at these maps. And in fact, in Geoda, it is fairly straightforward to look at the neighbors of a selection. So you um, pick, for example, this point, and then you see what the neighbors are. But then here we find an interesting phenomenon. And that I'll get back to that when I talk about significance and interpretation. So these are really devices, again, if I can use that term, to bring out structure in the data. And so, uh, as I mentioned, this is a, an underestimate of the extent of the actual cluster. But on the other hand, I also pointed out that 0.05 is probably way too liberal given all the complications with p-values that we'll talk about later. So then you might go to 2.01, but lo and behold, the regions of interest that we identify with the cores at a tighter p-value that include their neighbors become very similar to the ones that we had before, except that some parts are completely eliminated. So these are really then the interpretation of the important clusters. On the one hand, in the south and east of the country, there's a cluster of low donations in the north and in uh, Normandy, I believe, uh, there's a cluster of high values. So that's um, how we interpret this. So. This is probably the most important lecture of all of them in that it brings uh, forward the notion of a local spatial autocorrelation statistic, which is a very efficient device to find patterns in the data, patterns visualized by means of a cluster map, which shows the cores of the clusters that are significant and classified as high, high and low, low for positive spatial autocorrelation or clusters and low high and high low for negative spatial autocorrelation or the notion of spatial outliers.